doing it that way, um, about three to five times a week and uh, produce a lot of premium content. Uh, so if you want to check out HTTPS uh, slash slash AI dot science. So it's a really easy domain name to, to remember this AI dot science log in. You can be able to see the slides from this chat that we're going to have as well as some of the other premium content we've put together. So um, the other thing is, that I'd like you to do is um, I'd really like you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. So there's a little button there. If you give that a subscription, it means that you're going to be able to stay on top of this information. Uh, and right now we have actually got 14 different streams that are focused on different ML topics. Um, and this one here we're going to talk about today is in the AI and product stream. So um, today I'm really, really pleased to announce uh, that we've got Shonek Mitra from uh, MathWorks. Okay, So he's a product manager of deep learning and MathWorks. And he's going to talk a little bit about the importance of strategy in AI product management. So if you give me a sec, I'll give you a little bit of a bio on Shonak. Um, so Shonak is the product manager for deep learning and AI at MathWorks, who are the makers of MATLAB and Simulink. And before Matt, joining MathWorks, he got two master's degrees in mathematics and statistics and structural engineering from the University of New Hampshire. At MathWorks, he manages the deep learning toolbox. It's the core AI framework in MATLAB. And he has worked on various aspects of the product management and marketing of this product, such as the strategy, roadmap, competitive assessment, product development, launch, post-launch assessment, promotion, et cetera. And he's involved in all aspects of the product journey. So um, I'm really, really, really excited to, you know, hear from Shonak today a little bit about, you know, strategy and AI product management because it is an emerging field and someone from the front end of it will definitely be able to bring a lot of perspective to the conversation today. Um, I might also just jump it in there that in his free time, Shonak likes to uh, build applications, work on new ideas, play music and mountain bike. He's also passionate about climate change and diversity inclusion. So I'm um, really looking forward to this conversation today. And why don't I do that? I'm just going to pass it over to you, Shanak, to take it away and uh, you know cool. help us along this journey. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ashley. Thank you. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about um, some of the things that I've learned over the last three and a half, four years of working at MathWorks and previously working at other software companies about the importance of strategy in product management and specifically um, AI product management. Some of the things that I'll talk about will fall broadly in the category of product management, but uh, I'll be talking about some use cases, some experiences that I've had that make strategy specifically very important, having a dynamic strategy important in an ever evolving and changing field like AI. So that's the context of my talk today. And before I jump into the core topics, I wanted to give you a brief overview of what are the different things I do at MathWorks and what are the different products that I've worked on and what are the teams that I work with at MathWorks so that you get an idea about what a product manager does um, in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, so, all right. So, when you, when you do deep learning or when you apply AI, you think of different applications wherein you built your AI uh, algorithms for. For example, you can do it for a computer vision application. For example, you are counting the number of cars on the road, or you are trying to um, understand the drivable path for an autonomous vehicle, or you are uh, trying to understand uh, some of the uh, nitty gritties in uh, uh, tweets on Twitter or you're trying to understand speech. So there are different teams that work on different aspects of AI. And what I work on is the code framework that enables and makes it possible to um, do all these uh, different domain-specific applications. So that's where I come into the picture. So I'm the product manager for Deep Learning Toolbox, which is the core AI framework, as Ashley mentioned, that works with all the different teams uh, together to provide a basic infrastructure for them to build applications on for the customers that we service across the major industry segments that you can think of. So how deep learning is used today? So what are the different things that we do versus what are the things that is available today? So for example, in mainstream applications for deep learning, you would uh, you might have seen already or you might be already aware that things like GANs, generative adversarial networks, they are used to detect faces and um, there are algorithms for object detection that are used to determine uh, dogs or cycles or cars like in this picture on the left. 
Uh, this is the mainstream applications that you see on the internet that are more popular. But what we also focus on is uh, applications of these technologies in industries and um, engineering and science. That's where our major expertise comes in, and that's where I mainly work on. For example, in this picture, you're looking at um, how Shell uses AI and object detection frameworks to identify machineries um, in their uh, manufacturing plant. Uh, similarly, there are different applications uh, of AI that different um, industry segments, uh, big players in the industry segments use. For example, Airbus uses AI for defect detection on uh, their wingspan and to make sure that they maintain the longevity of the uh, wings. Uh, Denso uses it for control application. Shell uses it for earthquake related application. Uh, one of the most important applications of AI in the recent uh, time is, is, is medical sciences. And that's where we are seeing most of the breakthroughs in AI, for example, tumor detection, and also to understand uh, speech, how you convert a speech to an image and how you uh, Analyze that using neural networks to get the outputs that you want. So the different industry segments use AI and deep learning in different ways. And we service to these engineering and sciences applications specifically. Some of the products that I've built that I've that I've built and I've worked on with different teams are things like this. Uh, for example, we have built this uh, tools or tool chain that enables you to uh, detect uh, build uh, uh, applications to detect stop signs on the road or detect cars on the road or to find drivable paths but for autonomous systems. You don't want to drive on the pavement or the sidewalk, as they call it in America. And uh, some of the other applications uh, that I have also worked on, I built examples on, uh, worked very closely with customers on is how do you use AI for time series applications, things like that. So the strategy needs to be slightly different when you are um, approaching different type of applications that customers are interested in. It cannot be one size fits all. So similarly, when you understand speech to text kind of applications, it's slightly different. There are other types of applications such as how you use AI to um, teach a car to navigate through the traffic, how you build models and simulations of things that do different things. So these are all the products that I've been a part of with the teams that have build this and how you teach a robot to walk on a straight line without falling. Now, this was done after thousands of simulations and thousands of iterations. Um, and it was done using a technology called as reinforcement learning, which is a part of AI. So that was a little bit about myself. Hope I did not uh, talk a lot about it. And um, next up, I'll be talking about these four things today. I'll be starting with. Um, what is a product strategy? Um, how does it fit in in the overall scheme of the things that a company is trying to do in a year? Um, why is it important? Why is the strategy important? And um, also the steps for creating a product strategy. Now, we are not going to be experts in product strategy by the end of this call. Even I'm not. But, but, but I hope to share some of my experiences with you guys just for you guys to learn um, something from me, and hopefully with the interactions that we'll be having, um, I'll also learn things from you. So I want the session to be as interactive as possible. Feel free to ask me any questions at any time. And um, yeah, feel free to stop me. So product strategy is basically just a plan, just, just a plan that you do when you plan a trip or anything. It's just a plan on how you will achieve your goals and objectives for your product. Uh, now, product strategy is very, very tightly dependent on what you see in the market. But if you look at, in, look, look at it in silo, which in a way you should never do, but let's look at it in silo at this point in time, the different things that a product strategy contains is objectives that comes from the market, objective and goals that comes from the market, uh, roadmap, what do you want to build, and how you want to build this is uh, basically the prioritization. You don't want to build something that customers are never going to use, so you need to prioritize. Um, you also use strategy to identify growth opportunities in different areas. For example, these just robotics autonomous systems are very hot. So how you build your products geared towards robotics and autonomous systems versus something else that is not as hot. 
Um, and also product strategy uh, needs to be very closely aligned and tied with company strategy and company mission. So, so this is very important. You don't, so for example, MathWorks focuses on um, building applications for to help engineers and scientists. Now, we don't want to build something that they are not going to, that engineers, in a, our scientists in advanced research labs, they're not going to use. So it's very important for us to like make sure that whatever we decide, our objectives and goals align with the overall mission um, and the vision of the company. So how does the strategy fit in the company planning cycle? Now, you, now just building a product strategy is not enough. It, we need to look at it from maybe a 20,000 uh, feet um, height. So we need to understand how does it fit in the broader scheme of things before we dive into the details. Now, in a typical company cycle, I'm not saying this is what exactly happens in each and every company. This is just a, a reference uh, from my understanding over the years, is that in the month of January, when uh, the new year starts, um, there are typically uh, a big, huge sales meeting that many of the big corporates do, where we decide what are the goals for this year, what are the objectives that we are going to achieve in, with regards to dollars and cents, to be very honest there. And it happens typically in the month of January, the start of the year. And uh, throughout the year, people start, uh, people build applications, people do research, people do sales to improve the uh, rev revenues. And of course, they build content to do marketing. So this happens all year round, the product development and other things. Strategy planning happens sometimes around September to November timeframe. Uh, it, it's, so it's basically like eight to nine months into the year that when you make sure that, okay, if we need to again strategize and re-strategize about the next year. And that takes about three to four months, the process of strategy planning. It's not a two week sprint that you would do. It takes a good chunk of time. And that leads to your company headcount. And that leads to the um, analysis of return on investment on how much how much you're making, how much shortfall you, uh, how much, how much you need to make, how much profit or loss you're at, and it's basically a cycle. It's basically a cycle. So these are the major things that happen in a company, and strategy fits in as a very, very um, tight cog in this wheel uh, of company planning cycle. Mm -hmm. I I'm wondering if you could um, just at this point here kind of shape for. Uh, the audience a little bit about you know where the customer's impact is most felt in this planning cycle or even maybe on uh, your previous slide that was relating to you know the steps in developing a strategy. Right, right. So customer impact is um, something that is um, there in each and every part of this uh, cycle. Like for example, when sales decides goals for the years, the sales are the people who are very, very close to the customers. They are the pe people who are on the field. They talk to the customers. So they will bring all that information to all of us. Um, and they would tell us what exactly the customer wants and what we need to build to increase our market share, to uh, improve our differentiators. And that exactly feeds to other planning things like how you build the product that has to be customer centric. And strategy planning, customer is at the center of strategy. Without without taking customer inputs, there is no, there cannot be any strategy. And of course, we increase the headcount or not increase the headcount. Sometimes, for example, some of the companies are on a hiring freeze because of COVID, but uh, but things are getting better. So there are things that we do throughout this cycle that is super customer centric at each and every stage. And I'll be talking about how important that customer centric approach is in maybe the next slide, hopefully. Beautiful. All right. Thank you. Cool. So these are the four pillars of product management. Um, uh, of a typical product, ma a typical product manager basically does these four things at least once during their uh, tenure of being a product manager. And it takes it, and you cannot do all these things in a year. It takes you about four to five years to have your um, hands have your hands dirty in all these different aspects. For example. You start with market intelligence. You take that market in intelligence from a strategy. And if you think that in the strategy, if you feel that, well, there's a new product development idea that someone has and, and somebody's doing research in an office and you have a brilliant idea, 
and after doing strategy, you feel that, yes, we should go ahead in that direction, then a product manager also helps in building new products. And of course, when you have products, you of course have to work on the lifecycle management of the products. For example, if a, prod, if a pro new product gets launched, you have to work through the launch of the product, working with different marketing teams. You need to do post-launch assessments, how that product is doing, you need to support it with sales and application engineers and other people. And sometimes the products get sunset. Um, they are not being, they are not used anymore. So you need to take care of that. You need to be responsible for finance and other things as well. Of course, you will work with different departments. So a product manager's role is very, very broad. It's very, very rewarding. It's very, very broad. And specifically in the field of AI, you get to like work on ideas that you couldn't, that you might not even thought that you would work on two, two or three years back. So, so this is um, the, the the spectrum is pretty broad, and you work with like eight or ten teams at one time, um, um, and different teams. So, um, so one of the things that I want to focus on, um, I know that the focus of this talk is strategy, but I want to talk a little bit about market intelligence because it's very closely tied to the strategy, and also because um, Ashley had a question about how important is the role of the customer here. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about talk a little bit about a BlackBerry story that I that I kind of read um, a few months back in a book called as Innovator Solutions. I, that's a very nice read uh, if you want to read about product management. So BlackBerry, as you all might know, um, not many people use it <laughs> anymore. But it was founded by a company in Canada, um, Research in Motion. All right. And let's go back like 10, 15 years back in time. And at that time, BlackBerry was this wireless handheld device that people were using. It was doing everything that people wanted. And the executives were scratching their head that how do we innovate further? How do we push the boundaries? Now they were getting ideas about things to do. For example, one approach to uh, build products and uh, push the boundaries is to see what your competitors are doing. That's one of the simple things. So, for example, at that time, Nokia introduced uh, had introduced a thing called as SMS, the short message service. BlackBerry was focused more on emails and all those things the, for the for the business kind of people. Uh, Sony was working mainly on um, providing camera support for the phone. So these were all the things that the competitors were doing. Now, at that point. If BlackBerry had thought that, OK, so the competitors are doing n number of things, so we should focus on the gap analysis, and we should do those n number of things. And at that, and after maybe two years, we will be at feature parity with the competitors. And that's how we want to push boundaries. Now, there's a major flaw in this approach. And that is, if you try to build a product that's based on covering only feature gaps, you're going to build a product that is something similar to one size fits all. You are not going to build a product that is that does one job, one specific job very, very well. And you are at a risk of building a product that could be useful for people, but might not be used by a uh, majority of them. So one, so one approach that um, the BlackBerry people could have done is also build uh, the next uh, innovation based on the demographic, the demographies of the people. But then they thought about it and they thought that what exactly are the customers of BlackBerry trying to achieve here? What job are they trying to do here? So this is something called as circumstance-based thinking of the customer. Now, a customer hires a product to do a particular job. Now, what is that job? If you understand that part, you understand the market. And that's how you should do your market segmentation, not by features, by what job the customer is trying to do. By doing some research, they understood that, well, people use mostly pick up BlackBerry when the meetings are running a little bit slow, when someone like me is giving a talk and it's kind of boring and it's not making any sense, you check your phones, like Ashley might not be doing it at this point. <laughs> but but this is this is what people do. All right, I see Ashley. <laughs> so, so, so people usually pick up BlackBerry to just like quickly check their emails or check what the weather is or check how the stocks are doing in Wall Street Journal. So their competitors are not Nokia at this time. Their competitors, the 
and is not Sony. People are not trying to click pictures in between meetings. That's not kind of not allowed. I, I, I know people do that at times, <laughs> but uh, people are trying to. People are picking a Wall Street Journal. Pick, uh, people are checking the weather. People are playing some games. So that's that's what that's what BlackBerry is competing against. Wall Street Journal, some game application. If so, if so, at that time they figured out that what if we provide Wall Street updates or financial updates on the phone itself, then people won't need to get away from BlackBerry and things like. So it's the school of thinking. It's the way you think about how your product is being used by and back it up with customer data. It's then when you build products that people are going to use. You have to build products that become part of your customers' life, uh, lives and their daily work. And unless it's done like that it's not going to um, it's it's not going to be adopted at a, a broader scale so actually to answer your question uh, so that was all my <laughs> explanation behind how important a customer is for the entire product building um, um, for that for that matter and so at this point I have another framework on the bottom right of the screen which is called a pragmatic marketing framework uh, I could I could share the slides at the end and you can take a look at it. Uh, it's another framework in which you can try to do um, product marketing, product management. It's something that we at MathWorks follow very very closely, um, and um, uh, we are uh, we adhere by these guidelines very very strictly. Mm -hmm. um, so if I if I just stop you there for just a second, like I really like this this view of the customer. I really like the view of um, you know your product doing a job for them. Um, for the people that are you know, on the stream right now that have got a customer as well, I, I would ask maybe two questions. Like first, like what is it that makes an AI customer unique, OK? Um, so like in, in your case, I think you would probably be speaking from whatever context you want, but like from you know, mm -hmm. deep, frame, deep learning uh, toolbox and the deep learning framework kind of view, like what makes a customer unique for one of mm -hmm. those products? Mm -hmm. And then I'll ask a follow up just after that. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So uh, there are many aspects that make so each and every customer is unique. Each and every use case is different than the other. All right. Even within the same team, we have talked to customers that have totally unique use cases. Now I can like pick themes here that we see. So one of the themes is the uh, is the type of application that the customer is trying to build makes the customer very, very unique. For example, um, um, I had I had this uh, customer at a major uh, medical facility, and they were uh, building applications to determine cancer cells, to segregate cancer cells from uh, the non-cancerous one. And their colleagues were taking it a step further. They were trying to categorize how bad were the cancer cells from each other? They were tearing the cancer cells. So these both customers are very, very unique. They're trying to kind of do the same thing, but in a but in different ways and slightly different applications as well. It also makes them very unique, um, uh, depending on how much information and knowledge they have about uh, using AI in their domains, because these people are domain experts. Like these are like senior scientists and staff scientists. So these are like top of the uh, uh, tier people. And it's very important for them to understand how to use AI. Now, it re it's really rewarding to like uh, interact with these kind of customers because you get to know that someone who is like a senior scientist at some uh, uh, medical lab or at, some, or, or at any national lab for that matter, they might not understand the first thing about AI. And that's what makes them unique. And that's what makes uh, uh, Tools like uh, tools that make it easier for them for them to be a domain expert ra rather than a computer scientist uh, and figure out how the different layers of the neural network work. They don't want to do that. They want to use that to figure out the unknown in their fields. So that's what kind of makes them unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really like that. And you know, layering on to what you were saying about the um, what job is your product or what job is each feature doing for somebody it's like in, in this case like with this you know presence of all this uniqueness and all of these different types of customers um, is there a good way for you know the people that are on the call right now to think about um, 
how do I prioritize which job I should be focusing on? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So there is there is no one answer to this kind of a question because this is a very important topic, prioritization. I'll be covering it um, in the next few slides, but I can give you a short answer for it. So there are different techniques for road mapping and prioritization. And, and sometimes you need to uh, think about the cost benefit, like what is the development effort needed uh, for this particular feature building versus what is the um, um, return on investment we are gonna get uh, if the developers are building these kind of features. And there's also this uh, um, uh, way of thinking called this Kano model or Kano model that I really like in which you think of customers' um, happiness as the top metric. Uh, depending on that, you kind of prioritize your feature building. And um, so we at MathWorks, we uh, focus heavily on customer requests. So, so, so that's the essence of what we build. We never, so, so we never build products that are uh, way far in the future. We build products that customers are asking for that we know that customers are going to build. Uh, are going to use. So we build products uh, for uh, those kind of customers. But yes, I'm going to talk about prioritization um, uh, in the next few minutes. Awesome. Uh, I'll just mention for the people on the stream, um, if you have a question, you know, feel free to type it, type it into the chat, and then I can uh, you know, funnel it over to Shonic. So back to you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for the nice questions. Now, next part is, why is strategy important now we so what is a strategy it's basically a plan how does it fit in the company planning cycle it's basically one of the things that you do in a year and which is which happens to be one of the most important things you do in a year uh, and then um not only that but what actually makes strategy important is something that we are going to see in the next few slides so uh building an efficient and dynamic strategy uh, makes sure that you are ahead of your competitors by building, uh, by doubling down on building differentiators. And where there are gaps in the strategy process, you identify those gaps. You try to close the gaps. You you devise pull ahead moves when you know that there are people who are doing something, but you know that you're going to do it much better than them. And ultimate goal is to make sure that your customers, the end users, they are happy and they are using your tools and it's easiest and it's easier for them to adopt your tools than some of the other tools that they might be familiar with. Now, here is this one quote that I really like from um, Netflix's um, chief operating of, uh, chief product officer. He says, um, we do strategies and our job is basically to delight our customers in a hard to copy margin enhancing way. So you need to expand on your differentiator. You need to make sure that they are stretched uh, depending on the different circumstances, for example, during COVID times, there are different ways in which customers have started using your tools um, across 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 different uh, different industries. For example, look at automotive, look at look at airline, look at oil and gas, look at tech, uh, which is like booming. But uh, but 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 there are different uh, types of customers who use these products and tools in different ways depending on the situation they are in. So so. One of the things that's very important is to make sure that you have a roadmap, have a product roadmap and do prioritization. So coming back to Ashley's question. So Ashley is like always a couple of steps ahead of <laughs> me during this talk. And that's what that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so 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 some somewhere I'm happy because kind of makes sense, right? You know this thing and then you want to know the next thing. So uh, so there are different ways in which you can do uh, prioritization. Um, uh, road, road mapping is one of the, what can I say, it's the soul of uh, road. So road mapping and prioritization is the soul of strategy. Without uh, nailing these two things down, you are setting yourself for failure. So uh, there are different ways in which you can do road mapping and prioritization. For example, you can calculate effort versus the return that you're getting or calculate or do some kind of a scoring. For example, you can rank the features that customers have asked for and do a simple benefit cost, cost benefit analysis and rank them one, two, three, four, whatever. Um, 
But one of the things that I really like is this Kano model that I was talking about a couple of minutes back, in which uh, one of the most important metric is the customer delight. You want to make sure that the customer is happy. And that ties back to uh, what the, C the CPO of Netflix uh, is saying here, to delight the customers in a hard to copy margin enhancing ways. Now, you also want to be aware of the investments that are needed. You don't want to build feature for one customer because they are they are a $20 million account and they are, re are requesting this feature and you want to build them because a $20 million account is going to be happy. It, it, it might work, but most of the times it might not work if you're a billion dollar company. It's $20 million is not something that uh, going to um, uh, building features specific to an account might not always be the best, um, might not always be in the best interest for other customers. Uh, so you really need to always find the sweet spot in which majority of your customers are going to be happy. And, um, and it also uh, depends on how you track your event reports, how you track your support cases, how you like know that, okay, these are the top things that are recurring and when that hits, a part, that hits a particular ceiling that, okay, we have enough number of cases that say that building uh, this kind of feature is important at this stage now. We are going to go ahead and build it. So that's what's needed. Um, you don't want to, definitely don't want to be on the curve that is at the lower end, the orangish curve, wherein customers are not very happy and then you are also investing a lot in the, in the, in the uh, development. Now, there are n number of products that I can cite here, but I'm not going to. But you might be using those products in your day-to-day -day life. Um, uh, for example, think about a product that can um, um, uh, tell you what are, what, are the, so what are the groceries you have in your fridge available. Like, you can just open the fridge and see it for yourself. Like, like how many people do you think are going to use that versus something really uh, that can um, enhance the experience of the user overall? Mm -hmm. uh, so this this opens up a lot of questions for me, but um, I, I would like to start with a question that talks a bit about this dynamic product strategy, um, right. which which is tying to your role as a product manager. So mm -hmm. you know the 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 giant curveball that the world threw us, you know, beginning of the year, COVID, um, right. will definitely have had an effect on your product strategy. Right. But, you know what's it what's it actually been like to manage a product during um you know these times especially like an ai product yeah yeah so one of the things that happened at the beginning um in the march in the month of february and march when we were just hit by the news that we have to work from home is that we uh knew immediately that we need to have a plan have a plan because the the way the users use our products is not going to be the same again so, so, and we understood the importance of the lack of social interaction that the users were going to go through in the next foreseeable future. At that time, we thought it's gonna be three weeks, three months, and now it's a year into the future. So, so it's very important to make sure that um, you're engaged with the customer. You have high levels of engagement with the customer. You make sure that, the, that you are extra attentive to the customer's needs and the jobs they are trying to do. And uh, so basically, um, one of the things that we did, we kind of reworked the client engagement model. Uh, we kind of made sure that we are uh, more and more personal. Um, we support them at a personal level. We um, uh, kind of are very attentive. And also, we, one thing that we noticed a couple of months from March, uh, around the month of April and May, was that the attention span of the users were uh, drastically affected because of this. Now, previously, when we build products, we, as a product manager, I go to customers, give talks, I conduct seminars and stuff like that. And I used to give two-hour seminar, a three-hour seminar, a one-hour seminar, and different talks as well. Now, what I understood is that people are not attentive over a screen for three <laughs> hours. Like you, like you are already looking at your clock and seeing that, oh no, it's like already almost 40 minutes now and he's not stopping to talk. <laughs> so, 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 what we, so what we saw is that yes, cracking jokes help, but also another thing helps is that um, you really need to make sure your content is to the point. 
you, if a customer, for example, in my case, I'll just go back a few slides here. Uh, in my case, if a customer is interested, sorry for the scrolling here. If a customer is in, interested only in signal applications, how to use AI for time series applications to classify whether people are sitting, standing, or whatever the activity is, you cannot. You cannot go to that customer and talk about, well, we have these image processing algorithms that do this, this, and that. You can also use it for they are just going to you're just going to lose them. So you also have to make sure that you um, are kind of catering to the exact needs of the customer. So so the content that we started building for the customers were very, very focused on the vertical applications. Like mm -hmm. for example, if someone is from radar and communication, we are not going to tell them about reinforcement learning. Um, uh, we are going to tell them about examples and the things that you would see in uh, radar and communication, things like that. So I'm going to scroll again. So those are the different things that uh, is kind of important to make sure that your strategy is dynamic with the changing environment, that you are not stuck to one mode of uh, uh, building products. You are So you know that your focus needs to shift from like putting your head down and building products to make sure that your customers are more and more um, um, uh, attended to. And I, I love that. I love that story. I think it really speaks to you know the dynamic nature of the company you're working at, right? But like, I'm also loving this candle model, and um, not really that familiar with it. But um, in the AI framework world, how does one measure mm -hmm. customer delight? That's very. That's a. That's a very good question. So, one of the things that um, I would have covered if I was talking about market analysis, that's like my favorite part in the entire thing. Uh, would have been um, customer. Would have been how to measure customers' delights. And 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 one of the ways to do is is do it is doing customer interviews. So people do win loss assessments. Win loss assessment all the time. Uh, uh, but but if you really try to understand the job that the customer is trying to do, coming circling back to the BlackBerry story, if you're really trying to understand what why the customer is hiring your product for? What's the reason? And if you understand that job, you will make that customer happy because you are going to build a product that will be used by the customer and that will make the customer happy. So interviewing with customers is the number one thing that I would recommend and it's something that I do all the time. It's not just customer meetings. These are different things. Mm -hmm. Interviewing with customers is like one-on-one -on -one interaction with the customer, trying to go deep, 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 and trying to understand what exactly the customer is trying to do. So when you figure that out and when you see a common trend, so for example, I'll give an example on that. For example, um, uh, two years back, um, what we were seeing is that many of our customers were listening, uh, were trying to hear about things like GAN, the generative adversarial networks, and how they could use that for building fake faces and other things. Now, we know that that's mainstream, but we focus on engineering applications. So we've started talking to people working in industry and how they will use GANs, how they are going to use GANs. And, and, and talking to them, we kind of understood that the main things that they struggle with is enough number of images to form a representation of something. For example, um, there is this um, um, professor at uh, Stanford University. We are doing a very close research collaboration with them. Uh, they are using GANs to build fake images of uh, rocks after destructive electron microscope uh, processes, which are very expensive, by the way. So. They cannot like bring rocks, go to the lab, and do a destructive analysis of that rock. That that process is going to be very expensive. And finally, see how does it look like later on. They want to use GANs to mimic that process and to see what the end result will look like without actually doing that process. So 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 that's that's one data point that we got. That okay, they want to mimic. A scenario in the future without actually going through the process. And we talked to a dentist. The dentist wanted to um, 
build uh, crowns for some uh, some one of the one of the teeth one of the tooth and he told us that it takes uh, the designer about three to four days and the whole process about a month to build a crown um, and to actually that actually the his patients are happy with using GANs with his team with his research lab and uh, using GANs they were able to just take a picture and form various designs and find the optimal design within a matter of a few hours so that's what the that's what the importance uh, of these advanced tech, uh, techniques, uh, techniques and technologies are to our customers that using GANs and these kind of applications. So that's the customer delight that we were looking for there. How do, how do they use GANs for these um, advanced type of applications while making their life easier? I love it. So, <laughs> I love the idea of like making like crowns and stuff like that with AI. <laughs> like some people are folding proteins and some people are making teeth. Like the diversity of this field is amazing and I, I get blown away by it all the time. Um, yeah, yeah. Cool. So, so what, what, what's next in the presentation? So yeah, so one of the other important thing is um, why this strategy is important is also um, that it helps you identify growth opportunities. So like at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned about the increase on focus on autonomous systems and robotics and all those applications. But how do you know that? How do you know that those, those areas are um, um, uh, worth investing in? Without a proper strategy, you will not be able to um, have good measures and roadmaps and prioritization to kind of invest and capitalize on those opportunities. So, so strategy helps you identify new market opportunities. Um, now, for example, there is a huge market opportunity for uh, uh, for COVID-related applications, right? So there are many companies that are kind of bubbling up and they are kind of building their own algorithms to uh, find different things and different trends of COVID and different projections. And of course, the established companies are doing that as well. Uh, new teams have been formed in the established companies that I know of. So, so, so these are the market opportunities that strategy actually gives you. You need to get a few heads in the room, start thinking, and build a plan. And uh, one of the also, one of the other important things why strategy is important because uh, you need to make sure while building a plan that it aligns with the with what the company is trying to do. Now, if you are trying to build an autonomous system for Pfizer. I'm not sure how it's that going to be used, but if you have enough explanations on how you are going to use that in a medical application, that might be that might be useful. So it needs to align with the broader company strategy and vision and mission statement. So that's why having a good strategy is very important. The first thing you do in a strategy is basically paint a picture of the vision, make sure it's aligned with the company statement. And, um, and 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 one thing I know is that um, uh, for different uh, products in Facebook, so Facebook has this um, um, uh, applied machine learning team that basically caters to the different products that you use, like Facebook Marketplace, Oculus, or um, a number of products that Facebook has. And there, there, there's this core framework team that Facebook has that actually does the research. Now. If you try to build a product in Facebook, they are not going to build it just randomly, just because they can, just because they are a giant in the uh, tech industry. They're going to make sure that it aligns with the company strategy of bringing people together, help people connect. That's the underlying theme of how they build the products. And that's why all the products, Instagram, anything, you would see that it's in a way, it's building, it's bringing people together. It's mm -hmm. kind of connecting people. So there's always this alignment with broader uh, company strategy that you will see in uh, building these products. And same is the case with MathWorks as well. It's easier to understand Facebook than it's easier to understand MathWorks, but uh, um, uh, because we all use <laughs> Facebook, don't we? <laughs> it's Facebook. <laughs> yeah, it's Facebook. It's Facebook, right? So, so yeah, 
I, I, I just like, I, I like your view on vision and, you know, for the people on the call, I would also like to hear your perspective on, you know, a bit of the visionary side of AI when it really comes down to it. Um, and like, let's just pretend that, you know, some random normal person, okay, somebody that doesn't know that much about AI is, you know, transported five years into the future, right? And, mm -hmm. I, and I drop them into, you know, North America five years from now, 2025 or so, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are they shocked by when it comes to AI? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So so uh, to ans before, answer, before I answer that question, so whenever we build strategy, we build strategy for short term, we build strategy for long term. So we try to project ourselves or the market three to five years down the line. What, where will the market be? Where will the customers be uh, in five years time? And how can we reach there? So for example, there's this thing on, uh, so I'll come back to this person of yours, uh, Ashley, but there's this thing on um, certification and verification and validation, right? So five years back, think about five years back, uh, people mostly were kind of trying to get familiar with how to build a neural network and like like things like GANs and like, like what are the different nice things that you can build with neural networks? Like they were amazed by it. They were like, and if you had told someone at that time that these GANs type applications would be used by the top aerospace, aero, aero, by the top aero defense automotive customers to like build autonomous systems and that will like just drive them uh, themselves it would have been slightly like uh, a sh kind of a shock because we never assumed so around 2017 2018 what started happening is that we understood that we have enough we have enough tech, uh, research done we now start we now want to go into the uh, we now want to go into building applications using that research so now we are at a stage when we know how to build application so we are kind of ai ready so five years back we were kind of ai novice and now we are kind of ai ready um most of the companies are still on their way to becoming ai ready but some of the customers that we see they are more or less they know how to do ai or they have teams internally that know how to do ai five years time down the line things like um and some of the things we already see that are becoming more and more important is like diversity inclusion and like face recognition softwares that like how much bias is induced on those kind of software uh things like certification like if you are building using ai for medical applications there is this different kind of certification setup that you have to go through fda and other things if you are going to build autonomous systems there are, there are different kind of certifications that you want to build so now we are at the stage where we are building technology and we are starting to think about these kind of measures where we hold these algorithms accountable uh, sometime in the future so so five years down the line um people would mostly be very familiar with these kind of certification verification validations like they really understand why the network is doing something it is doing uh, and um, also would be able to validate those uh, claims made by the network mm -hmm. and and if a person doesn't know about ai today and that person um, goes in the future that person is going to find themselves in the magic world because some of the things like autonomous systems, uh, like I keep coming back to, they are already some of the prototypes are at level four and level five these days, uh, which is like kind of uh, fully autonomous systems. And, and some of the things that uh, we are working on, for example, in the medical domain, for example, using AI for protein folding and other things. So these are things that will only evolve with uh, uh, tech, with technologies like reinforcement learning and other things, so so five years down the line, we will be not close to a general intelligence because that's still way into the future, but we'll be taking steps towards it so that when you look back at 2020, it will look like how we are how we how we look at 2012, 2014, 2015 now. So 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 we are kind of sur uh, surprised on how AI has 
led to so many jobs. One of the one of the biggest threats that people felt was that AI is going to take away their jobs, but it has created so many job opportunities for people. It has almost made it mandatory for the major institutes in the university in the world to have some kind of data analytics, data science, AI kind of a um, major. So, so, so these are the changes that we are seeing and we will continue to see in the next mm -hmm. three to five years um, in the field of AI. It, I think it'll be crazy. Like it really depends on where they land in a way, right? Like imagine they land at an airport, right? Like, you, <laughs> you know, you, like you zap Sean like five years and then drop him into, you know, an airport. Like, oh, well, the bag seems to just kind of walk itself, you know, or like maybe like, <laughs> you know, like I, there's there's no there's no identification required because you already checked in online and it knows that you know that you're you're safe and whatever you can get on the plane there are no pilots there's like a robot serving you know your food on the plane there are no tickets you, like like all these transformational changes will feel like all at the same time like such a massive change but they'll probably happen very slowly it's the whole like i think i think it was bill gates quote right like technology doesn't really it doesn't doesn't shock you in the short term, but it really shocks you in the long term. And I like I feel like where you're at in you know this field is is kind of like seeing the future before it happens in a way. You know, working with you know robots and working with you know these these pretty advanced technologies that you know were in movies. Let's be honest, right? Like it just didn't seem possible. But um, the other thing that I think that I pulled out of that too was that I think people will be surprised that AI is actually fair. Mm -hmm. Right now, it doesn't seem that way. And I think that that's also, you know, a representation of, yep. you know, where we're at in terms of explainability, right? You had talked yep. about bias, you had talked about right. you know, our, our ability to program this for fitness with, you know, society today, because the thing is mm -hmm. that like we're, we're using a lot of these old data sets Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we now exactly. know better. <laughs> exactly. You know, exactly. With yeah. with GANs, the ability to generate data sets is also, you know, an exciting frontier of um of AI and where, you know, yeah. it maybe maybe I'll also maybe ask the same question then again. Um, but from for your perspective, right? Like mm -hmm. what will you be surprised if you don't see and now let's let's talk about this more along the lines of like the the ai framework side of things you mm -hmm. know like you, you obviously don't have to give away any like secret sauce or anything like that but like mm -hmm. you know the ai framework seeing as they are today mm -hmm. yep there is obviously room for like lots and lots of lots and lots of improvement in a lot of different ways but you know what what do you think the you know the five-year version of the ai mm -hmm. framework what is one yep. feature that it has that one of the frameworks today does not have? Yep. So one of the things that I think is going to happen, it's already happening, is that people will write less and less code. Mm -hmm. uh, there is going to be apps that are going to be helpful in making extremely productive into building neural networks, into training them, into validating them, into explaining what's happening to different kinds of visualizations that they will provide. And there are already tons of apps that you see today in terms when you think about deep learning framework as a as a tool, but in, you really don't need to code as much uh, uh, these days as you needed, say, 10 years back when you had to basically build a simple neural network. There were no libraries to begin with, to be honest. There, be, people were like you using the mathematical libraries to just multiply two matrices element-wise and 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 see what's happening there. And now we have libraries, and so now we don't have to write a hundred-line code for few operations. Now may, maybe we have to write twenty lines. And in the future, if you only think about the framework, people will write less and less code because. Uh, uh, things are going to get easier and easier. And that's when you know that people are starting to get productive mm -hmm. and people and domain experts, they can focus on expanding and pushing the boundaries in their domains rather, rather than writing a C++ version of the code you have written in Python for performance improvement because everything will be done. So, 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 so that will be, that will make them more productive. They'll have more time. 
Um, so that's one thing that I'll be shocked if I don't see in the next three to five years uh, that uh, will happen. And mm -hmm. come back to your airport story. Don't we already have it with Amazon Go these days at Seattle? <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I have been so you just airport. walk in, grab the stuff, and get oh, out. Sorry. Yeah, that's true. That's very, very true. Like, I think <laughs> that we're we're probably already seeing the signs of what the future is. It's just not evenly spread. You know, that's the you know the same old quote as well. Um, the the airport, I think, is a good kind of microcosm because it's a very, like, how much has the airport really changed foundationally since, call it the 30s, call it the 40s, call it the 50s, right? Like, it's probably, like, you probably would have walked into an airport in, you know, 2020 from the 30s and been like, yeah, I guess sure. this still is about the same. Like, obviously, like, there's not as much merchandise and yep. security is a crazy thing, but yep. there's still a plane there. Now, like, I think that AI tends to probably fundamentally change that as well, given the, you know, the ability for us to shrink distances between people, for us to also maybe, maybe there's a, like the AI being a meta technology also maybe brings a whole new, call it, uh, means of travel, like personal travel. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't know where this all goes, but um, it, yeah. it'll definitely be interesting. That's that's definitely for sure. Um, I, I can't remember how do we have much more slides yet? Because I'd like to give the people on the chat a chance to to, sure, to yeah, jump yeah, in I mean, on the conversation. So yeah. there, there are a couple of people on there. So if you if you guys have any any questions you'd like to ask Sean, you know, about AI and product management and you know all these things we've been talking about, you know, feel free to put them in there and then uh, we'll we'll feed them this way. So all good questions, actually. Um, my last section I want to cover is about how to create a product strategy. Now, I don't have very many slides for these, but I am but I can talk about these based on these points. Um, I can go on and on, but I'll keep it short at this stage. Um, so the first thing that you start with when you build a strategy is, of course, you want to take customer data and all those things, but you need to have a vision of what you want to build. You need to have a vision of what uh, what your what your uh, uh, what your uh, application product that you're building would look like, um, and who it will service, or who or for whom you're building the products. Then, for product strategy, you want to build a team. Um, you shouldn't do it by yourself at all. <laughs> um, and there's a team of developers they you should do it with a team of developers you should do it with um, and by you i mean a product manager should do it with a team of developers with uh, folks from marketing research and other di different departments consultancy and other different departments application engineering so so like i said before being a product manager at one time in at one point in time you work with at least eight or ten different teams um, so so uh, you need to make sure all the inputs come from all these teams. I need to make sure that the strategy is aligned with the company strategy. It's not very, very different. We have talked about it a few times, so I'll skip it. Uh, you want to make sure that your strategy addresses the most common pain points of your customers that came up in the market analysis. Now, you can hire third-party agencies to do your market analysis like many big companies do, or you could do it yourself. Uh, or you could do it with a team of developers. For for example, when you basically do a competitive analysis of uh, some technical tool, you want to dig into your dig into the other tools and get your hands dirty so that you understand what's going on. And when you discuss it with customers, because these tools often get uh, brought up during customer uh, engagements and conversations, then you know exactly what the customer is trying to do with that tool and where that tool fails or where you can compete versus where you can walk away. It's very important to know where, when you can walk away, when you need to walk away from an opportunity. You cannot always like bang on head in and uh, you cannot always win every opportunity. So, so this market data set will give you uh, understanding of that. Then you want to have some goals and objectives based on all these things on to what you're trying to build then you want to go into strategy, which basically contains your roadmap, your um, prioritization, 
and all those uh, good things we talked about. So one good paper that I um, have read and I would rec recommend you read is basically by Hambrick and, Fred and Fredrickson on, uh, it's called, Do You Really Have a Strategy? And before I go to this paper, I want to talk about the last point is that once you have a strategy, do not um, just let it remain there as a framework for people to follow. Just make sure that you at least visit it quarterly, if not um, every month, or at least visit it every six months, if not quarterly. Uh, and make sure that uh, it's kind of relevant. Uh, because in the field of AI, all these deep learning frameworks, they release, they have releases like, like, like I know, PyTorch had like seven releases, six or seven releases in nine months. That's a tremendous cadence of releasing your uh, uh, different versions of uh, uh, of your of your of your framework. And your six months this, and your strategy that you made like six months back is already obsolete because it's now six times better the the current framework of the competitor. Or and and same is the case with other kind of uh, workflows and other kind of product areas as well. Um, you you need to use the strategy for, to drive your headcount, drive your development and other things, but you also need to iterate on it. So coming back to the Hambrick and Fredrickson paper, so this is the strategy diagram that I really like. Now, there's a way to read this strategy diagram. You don't start anywhere. You start from the top portion, which is called as arenas. And as you can tell, I did not draw this figure. It's, it was it was sourced from uh, Google, and it comes from this paper. Um, are you sure you have a strategy by these authors? And you start with arenas. For example, you really need to understand what are the market segments. And we talked a little bit about how you can segment your market based on jobs that the customers are trying to do. And there are other things that you can understand by by looking into more into arenas, it's basically skimming the market. It's basically trying to understand the market. It basically will prepare you into answering the main burning question of what to build. Then once you know what to build, basically you want to understand, do you have resources to build that? Do you have enough expertise to build that? Do you have, uh, do you, is and is it something that is important to you, but you cannot build it, so you partner it with someone. And uh, for example, one case is when uh, the deep learning framework at MathWorks wanted to help customers to um, take their models into um, uh, GPUs into to like for like embedded deployment and um, or ARM CPUs or um, FPGAs for edge deployment. Now we don't we don't really do that. We don't really build hardware. So we are in, we are a, we are a software company. So one thing you do is you partner. So we partnered with Nvidia. We partnered with uh, Xilinx. We partnered with all these hardware vendors, and we kind of have an understanding that okay, great, awesome. So these are things that we don't do, and these are things that we do. You take our users are going to follow this workflow, and let's work together so that we know each other's release cadence and we know each other's. Uh, the products that we are going to build and things like that. So you partner basically, or sometimes you acquire too. If you are big enough, if you can acquire, you just acquire and acquire. We have seen several instances of big acquisitions in the past when Facebook acquired um, Instagram and uh, WhatsApp because because the motto because it was satisfying to their mission statement and vision that they were helping to bring people closer. Um, uh, Google uh, acquired Waymo, and there are various such other um, big acquisitions in the um, uh, not so fancy world, uh, multi-billion dollar acquisitions. For example, when NVIDIA acquired ARM and AMD acquired, I think, uh, Xilinx, if I'm not wrong. So these are like multi-billion, these are like double digit billion dollar acquisitions. So big acquisitions. So, so that's when like people acquire when they you're a big enough company, and then you focus. You once you understand what vehicles you have, you focus on differentiators and things like how are you going to win, what is making you win today, and how can you make sure that your competitors stay far, far away from you in that particular aspect. So, I'll give you one example here. For example, um, when um, so MATLAB as a deep learning framework. 
does not only support model building and model training, it also supports the entire AI workflow. For example, if you want to label your data set, we have labelers for images, uh, signals, audio. We have domain-specific pre-processing applications and tools that can help you um, work with any kind of data you have, like uh, be any kind of domain you're working with, like be it controls, radar, anything. And once you're happy with the model you have trained, you can also use our tools to deploy it and embed them into hardware devices. So, so basically, these are our differentiators that we kind of want to make sure that we kind of keep on stretching the gap as much as possible. And also, of course, um, you want to make sure that you are quick and fast to market. Then the fourth thing you want to look at is staging. That uh, basically, how you are going to now at this stage, you know what the market segment look like uh, looks like. You know your resources. You have an understanding of what you're best at, what you're not best at. And next is to sequence the events and basically strategize and, and basically build a roadmap and prioritize. So how are you going to build a sequence of moves to achieve this? So, so this is basically the strategy diagram. And the center of it sits economic logic, which basically makes sure that you don't like uh, uh, keep on shooting cannons um, in a field where there is no one there. Uh, so you need to make sure that you are investing in opportunities and verticals and industries when you are going to get back the stuff. So for example, uh, what are the things that uh, will help you compete better? Will lowering cost compete better for that? Does uh, a merger sound better or an acquisition sound better? You can just hire 50 developers and like it'll cost you $5 million or 100,000. And you, and you can just build a product. So it will be much cheaper than uh, acquiring, but do you have the expertise to do that? So these are different questions that you need to like think of um, from the economic point of view, the cost, the benefit and other things. So this is a strategy diagram, basically, that helps you think about the different aspects that we have been talking about for the last hour and how you can um, uh, work around it. So, so lastly, I would like to uh, leave with some takeaways here. So one thing I would like to mention is that uh, don't build your product strategy in a silo. Make sure it uh, is built when you and it's backed by market data. Um, uh, you don't build it in a silo also means that uh, a product manager and a developer, please don't like go ahead and build a strategy. You need to work with different teams, different developers, different pro other product managers if your product is that, um, uh, is that kind of a product. Uh, you need to understand the job of the customer that the, that the customer is trying to achieve uh, and, and not just build product features to compete with your competitors. Need to focus on the circumstance-based approach that I was talking about. And uh, one thing is a product strategy is something that takes time. Uh, so, so it has taken uh, many companies years to arrive at a strategy that is consistent and that is kind of uh, giving them um, uh, re rewards at a consistent basis. So. There are many market leaders that you can think of that have taken years to achieve that. For example, Amazon, um, for the first almost, what, 20 years or so, they were like, uh, their stock value was like down below. And then in 20 years, because of their customer-centric approach, the strategy did not change. Their, their approach might have changed here and they started investing in cloud and all those things, but now they're the leaders in that. So, so building a strategy takes time. Like looking into the future is very, very uh, is a is a step that is uh, that can be hit or a miss if it's not backed by enough market data. But but you need to have a belief it, that your strategy is going to work, and it definitely takes time. Start early. Make sure that you keep thinking about strategy throughout the year and not just during that one month when you're presenting to the CEO. And focus on a dynamic strategy. You need to like not build a strategy and leave it for good for six months, one year, depending on how hot your product areas are. Uh, you need to have a dynamic strategy that, that can that can cater to things like 
COVID, which I, I don't think anybody had a dynamic strategy to cater that, but you know, to be quick on your feet to make sure that you can shift your strategy a bit here and there based on the circumstances that you're subjected to. So with that, I would like to uh, stop here. If you have questions, feel free to ask. I, I definitely do have questions, um, but so I'm seeing any questions jump into the chat. So I'll, I'll just ask a couple and then if nothing, uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, I really like the chat and um, it kind of took me back to, you know, business world kind of thing. Um, and AI seems to be very, very good at tactics and very, very good with memory, right? And by combining the two, I can think about chess, right? I can memorize all the possible positions and I can know what the best possible move will be, you know, two or three steps out. And same with it's done with Go. Um, this is a more philosophical question, but like with enough data, whatever the data of strategy actually looks like, do you think AI would make a better strategist than, you know, the best human? So AI beat Kasparov and then, you know, AI would AlphaGo beat, uh, you know, the, the, the Go champion. Yep. What so, is the strategy itself? Business strategy. Yep. Yep. So in a way, so one thing, um, AI is basically good when you are trying to derive information from data sets. If you have a rule-based kind of a problem like chess or tic-tac-toe, uh, you can, you don't need AI for that. You can build like, Deep Blue beat Casper in 1998. There was no, like, there was like little AI in that. But it was still AI, sorry, I don't get me wrong. There was no deep learning in that. There was like a little bit of AI. There was no neural networks, but there was definitely AI. AI is rule-based, but it also takes into account rule-based. But when you back it up with data, the thing that is going to make a difference in AI becoming a good strategist or not, according to me, is causality. Like what causes this? What is the, so causality is one of the emerging areas of interest and research and like there is not much uh, uh, information that I think we have at this point, but once we understand the causality of what affects what. I mean, AI is already a strategist, if you think about it, like like, like the top hedge funds that manage triple digit billion dollar um, uh, 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 funds from all, from all the people, they use um, AI and they use uh, reinforcement learning to build buy, sell and hold kind of strategies in the financial market. And of course it is human in the loop. It's always human in the loop. There is not a chance that there is no human in the loop in when you're making those huge billion dollar investments and decisions. So human in the loop, causality are the different things that will help make AI a better strategist in the future. And, and currently we are just scratching the surface actually for these kind of problems. Like we are barely starting to like stand on our feet because for the first few years of AI, we focused so heavily on image applications, like uh, we only focused on image applications, signals, time series, radar, blah, 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 text, found their way like three, four years down the line. And now we are exploring other avenues as well, like input to a network is not a date, is not an image or a time series, it's a graph itself. So we are like exploring the different um, things, if the evolutions. Um, so, so, so once so talking about this graph, so there is this new kind of technology called graph convolution neural networks that kind of helps you build this strategy kind of uh, mindset for AI. Um, so what it does is basically it finds connections between different streams. It's very widely used in social media and uh, also in uh, 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 generation of drugs. Right? So when you work with different structures of molecules, so it like understands the underlying causality and the pat and the patterns of the of the interactions between entities. And when you understand that better, you can 
be a better strategist. Um, uh, so yes, I mean, definitely, I'm pretty sure there are companies um, that would be doing it in the near future. They use AI to build strategy, definitely today, but AI doesn't build strategy. There's always a human in the loop. Um, so, but that could be in the future sometime very soon, not, not far. Mm -hmm. It's a whole Ender's game idea where, you know, yeah. eventually yeah. like this machine yeah. will be better at, you know, planning the future than, you know, any human will. Uh, and that, that kind of, I think would make people uncomfortable. Um, yeah. but I feel like people also are just putting a name on something that they may not have no, well, they, they've inherently known was not necessarily AI, but it was a computer making the decision. Like, like mm -hmm. it's not like AI is using is uh, organizing the traffic lights. I don't think. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it isn't. Pretty sure these are largely rule based systems yeah. that you know based on the flow of vehicles and whatever else, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Our, our world is already kind of controlled by computers. It, mm -hmm. It's just kind of it's just kind of funny when we attach the word intelligence to it. Right. That makes right. it a little right. uncomfortable. Uh, with right. you know exactly. this, this whole idea of artificial intelligence and on the product side of things I think that's also something you have to you know you probably have to consider right is like this uncanny valley problem which is you know at, at some point we've either got to humanize this and yeah. make it give it a human face because that's the way people will trust it or we've got to go in the exact opposite direction which is make it as machine as possible because mm -hmm. that's how people can trust it so exactly. like like think of the, the the pilot right we can't make the ai look human like i i feel like i would trust it less if it was still if it was a robot flying the plane you know what have, i'm saying like haven't it, you it, haven't it, you watched westworld <laughs> but like have it, you seen that show oh yeah <laughs> like westworld is an incredible show like like <laughs> if it was a, a machine flying the plane though like you you look, look down the aisle and you're like yeah that's a robot i don't know how i feel about this but if i know a computer is flying the plane and it doesn't look like a human i'm actually more than likely but hmm, excellent mm -hmm. i like the sound of this all of a sudden um so i i think that this is this is a really interesting kind of world that we're living in as we kind of bridge the gap between you know before ai in after AI. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I want to come back to something you said earlier, which is um, based on the transition of companies. So you had said that there are like AI novice companies and AI ready companies. Like, mm -hmm. can you tell me more about, you know, the differences between those two and as a product manager, how you would interact with them? Sure. Yeah. So basically there are mainly three categories uh, that we kind of have in our head and we know of. Uh, one is AI novice, the other is AI ready, and the uh, next is the next level, which is AI expert, and they are, they are like already doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to AI novice company, they are typically domain experts. They are research scientists working on different uh, domain-specific applications, like somebody would be a modeling and simulation engineer in an automotive industry, but they might not know how to build a neural network, how to stack those layers up and how to like do all those things. So those are like AI novice kind of people. And they, most of the times, they know that they want to use AI, but they don't know exactly how. But they mm -hmm. know that AI might bring some benefit to them. And it's mostly a push that they might have gotten from the upper management that AI is everywhere. We need to be an AI first company. So that's so that's a motto, like right. So in the 1980s, people were becoming computer first. In 1990, it was internet first, and 90 and 2000, it was mo it was mobile and cell phone first, and now it's AI first. So 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 mm -hmm. it's so that's how the dynamic is changing. So mostly the AI novice people have gotten pushed from the upper management. AI ready people are those novices who have invested in AI for two three years or have gotten better, uh, people in their teams who have joined in and who bring in knowledge and, and, and information. When they know how to build networks, they know how to solve their problems using those tools. And But they are struggling in some way or the other, and they need help, but they have the resources to do it. They have mm -hmm. the right knowledge, right expertise, but they are struggling in terms of some resource or workflow issues 
that can be mitigated very, very quickly uh, by some intervention. An AI expert is a, uh, is a user or AI expert are companies, basically, if you look at Fair Lab, the Facebook Artificial Intelligence Lab, or Google Brain, for that matter, those are like not only AI ready, they're AI yeah, experts. They're like they are the people who are kind of doing these things, right? So, mm -hmm. so they are in a way they are showing us the way how to like do these things ahead. Mm -hmm. So, so, so these are the people who push the boundaries. They are experts, and uh, basically, when we talk about experts, we talk about um, advanced professors in research labs at universities and national labs and big research institutes like CERN and other places who are like who are AI experts who know how to use it, who are already doing it. They might just need some awareness around some new thing and they are and they'll be ready to go. Mm -hmm. So it's a very low touch engagement when it comes to uh, the business aspect of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. novice is a very high touch engagement. Like you need to have engineer sit with them and it's a deep engagement you need to have engineers sit with them and build a prototype based on the problems they are solving and that's when uh it's a high touch engagement so, so mm -hmm. yeah it's almost like the the idea has become commodified and now it's about extracting the value um and the the higher you go on your continuum just yeah. how well their machine is oiled, right? Think of think of the, the like the the like interacting with a you know Facebook AI you know research team or something like that. Like they know exactly what they want. Yeah, exactly. And therefore, they're they're looking at you know please solve this exact problem for me, <laughs> and I will solve it myself in three months if <laughs> yeah. if you know if if you don't come along with the exact thing that I like, right? Whereas the other side of it is I, I like yeah. you said, right? Very high touch. There's a lot of people involved in this conversation, right? You know, right. like yeah. we we still need to figure this out. Uh, yep. There's there's a lot left to do. Um, yep. I I really like that from also a you know like if you were going to start a startup, obviously you're you're a bit different because you you know a lot more about the industry than a lot of people who will. But like let's just say you're not so advanced in the startup world, or you're not so advanced in the AI startup world. Like, which of the three groups do you think is the most fruitful at this time? Like, in terms of selecting a customer base, or let's just say that you could build a product that would satisfy one of them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Which one do you think would be the one that's like, yeah, there's probably more opportunity there, or more valuable opportunity? Well, it heavily depends on basically the nature of the product that I'm building, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm building a, building a, say an autonomous vehicle, right? Uh, so my consumer is basically, like it could be anybody, but let that was a bad example. Sorry about that. If I'm building, say an app, or if I'm building a, platform for users to build an app yeah let's mm -hmm. let's mm -hmm. look at that so there are many platforms that can build apps for you you just need to drag and drop things these days yeah. right yeah mobile apps or web apps and things like that so these are basically novice users uh, who don't know how to code like me who are uh, kind of who want a ready solution for their problem they don't want to waste a lot of time into digging into the details mm -hmm want something ready, they're willing to pay money for it. And that's the, one of the biggest things, these AI novices people, they are willing to pay money for mm. something that they don't know. If you, you just have to push them enough that to make sure that they don't know, you you'd, obviously you won't uh, use uncertain, un, unfair means, but you would definitely try to probe, probe, and probe. So, so if I'm a startup, uh, it depends on the nature of applications I'm building. But it's it could be anybody to be honest. It could be so. For example, if a new deep learning framework comes into into the pic, uh, picture, like Julia came in like three years back, and it kind of took the world by storm. But they were catering to novice and expert users. So so it's very hard to say what product would would work for what type for 
customers unless we don't have information about the product. Mm -hmm. So I won't be able to answer this question, unfortunately, based on my understanding at this point. But yes, given a scenario, given a particular um, product or application, maybe we can brainstorm that. Mm. But um, yeah, it's, that's why this field is very interesting. You never know. You, you never have a certain answer about anything. It's all kind of subjective to begin with. Then you make it objective with, um, with uh, some learnings. So mm. yeah. interesting. Okay, so we're getting closer to the end of uh, the conversation. So maybe I'll uh, ask uh, my last question, and then we can kind of just wrap up. Sure. So, um, when was the last time that you were truly amazed by AI? You know, oh. and what was that? Okay. What was that moment? And when I mean by mm. truly amazed, it's more like, it's not like, oh, that's cool. It's like, what? Really? How? You know, like what, like closer to the incredulous than it is the, you know, the, wow, that's better than I could ever have thought it could be possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, we all know about the protein folding problem that was recently solved, right? So I'm not even going to go there. Uh, of course, that like kind of open, like that. Uh, that was super incredible, and like that was like I read that paper, and it was amazing how they built it. But one of the more <laughs> recent things that happened, I think it was a couple of weeks back. I was talking to this uh, big perfume manufacturer in Paris. Uh, it was yeah, France somewhere, and. Um, I was shocked to see how much expert they were in AI mm. and how they were using AI to build perfumes, uh, how, how they were using AI to build perfumes of different different, frac uh, different fragrances. Like, like if someone is in the mood, like they were categorizing it based on the moods and they were like categorizing it based on the, um, um demographics and like like they like had some input parameters and they were like coming up coming up with structures and they had assigned cat a classification categories to those molecular structures and they knew exactly what kind of perfume we are going to make and it was such an automated system end to end mm -hmm. i was like wow and these are like real experts in ai and like how they're using um these technologies to build these things these kind of applications so it was like really um a uh, fun thing for me to realize that even for something that is so trivial for us that we just walk into these stores and get a chanel or get a uh, jimmy Choo or something else we mm -hmm. don't realize that uh like so much ai has gone into building the exact molecular structure that will give it that kind of an aroma. Like I was on a call with um, a coffee brewing company as well. And you'd be shocked where all AI is being used these days. Like in the corners of the world, like you would like be amazed to like see how much mm -hmm. penetration it has had. So that was one of the things that was like, that happened like two weeks back. And mm -hmm. of course, a couple of days back, the protein folding problem was like really interesting to learn and how much AI can help in solving problems. Like I'm just waiting for the time when AI can solve some of the NP hard problems. <laughs> you never know. You never, you never know. know. You never know, yeah. Like I think that's the thing we've learned more recently, right? And I think what you're also seeing is you're seeing that AI is now starting to touch all aspects of our lives. And there will be people who aren't people who are building AI products that end up using AI ingredients. And I really love that idea. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really also hoping that uh, Shonak, you, you can, you know, jump on, you know, on the, the stream another time in the future sure, yeah, to, yeah. to give us, you know, to give us your, your more recent insight, insights at that time, because like, I feel like yeah. our our audience, as well as you know, I've definitely gotten a lot of really really cool insight into um, into the kind of the the closer to you know, like we're getting deeper into the matrix, if you know what I'm saying, because I feel like you're really really close to that. So I really really thank you for your time in not only preparing the presentation but you know hanging out and you know sharing yeah, sure, these yeah. insights uh, today. 
Um, but so, is there anything you'd like to wrap up on before uh, we kind of close the call? So one of the things that I would like to um, talk about is that if you're getting started with AI, if you want to get started with AI, you can um, uh, always reach out to me um, through Ashley or just mm -hmm. catch me on LinkedIn. Uh, there are different things that we can help you out with in training, in some of the guided evaluations. We conduct free seminars and workshops, how to mm -hmm. build AI applications. And we also have consulting and technical support. Technical support is free of cost, uh, basically, for us. Uh, and if you still want to get started, there are some free things that you could do online wherein you can um, use some deep learning on-ramp things. It's a very short thing. You can do some in-depth trainings, and you can do some, um, um, if you're teaching at a university, you can use deep learning with MATLAB for curriculum training as well. So that's about it from my end. And thank you so much, Ashley, for hosting me. And it was um, really very nice chatting with you And uh, again. And hopefully, people got something out of it. I think it was a really, really great chat. So thank you very much, and uh, you know, look forward to you know bringing you on in the future. I also shared your LinkedIn into the the chat, so sure, um, yep. expect uh, people to connect. But thank you very, very much. And uh, right, with that, you. we'll you know say goodbye, and uh, you know we'll catch you next time on the AI and product stream. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Ashley.